But anyway, guys, welcome back to another episode of Bass Quest. Today, we're going to be talking about the fall to winter transition, specifically on Chickamauga. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. What's up, Heath? Anyway, ho hopefully a few more people will start to file in here pretty soon. But I want to break down some of what's going on right now with this fall. So 2019, it's different than a lot of other falls before these fish are actually a lot they're like behind right now so let's go back and, and talk a little bit about what's been going on so beginning part of the year we had a ton of rain and what that did is it pushed the grass behind it kind of got the fish in a normal spring pattern we worked into a normal summer pattern where we were getting rain on and off kind of some normal summer temperatures actually relatively low for summer temperatures and what happened was the grass stayed really far behind now, fast forward a little bit and things have changed completely. So what happened is we had through the fall, really the late part of the summer into most of the fall, we've had a prolonged drought. And that drought has also come with it record temperatures. So when you get that going on, what that does is it allows that grass to grow much faster. Um, I actually didn't think we were going to have much grass on the mid to southern end of the lake this year. but completely wrong once that that month to two months that we had of that drought that grass grew so fast and what the reason why that happens is you have perfect growing conditions no rain and droughts mean a lot of sun which is great for photosynthesis you don't have the current so it's not uprooting the grass and the water clarity stays good so you get that sunlight penetration into deeper water so we got a lot of grass that actually grew out to that eight, 10, even 12 foot range. And that's really important when you're talking about late fall fishing and winter fishing, because as they start to drop the water on these TVA lakes, they drop the water in the winter time to kill off a lot of that grass and manage it. So when they do that, a lot of that deeper grass is going to actually be able to hang on for a long time. You'll have mats further into the, the winter, the fall and winter period. It could be really good for frog fishing and stuff, but that's what's going on this year. So when you're talking about having all of that, what's happened is the fish have been behind. It was actually funny in the first part of the summer there, it was almost like they were kind of ahead of schedule. And then all of a sudden we had that prolonged drought, all those record temperatures, it really dropped everything way off and completely out of whack. And what's happened now, instead of the fish being on their normal migration. A lot of fish have done that. They've migrated with the bait fish, but a lot of bait fish have actually stayed out main lake as well. So really a lot of summer patterns are still working really well. A lot of transition stuff that you would find fish on more like the beginning of the fall or going into winter, there's a lot of fish there already. Um, and there's a lot of fish all the way in the backs of major creeks and super shallow water and backs of pockets in super shallow water upon big main lake flats. So there's just, a whole lot going on the fish are not ultra ultra concentrated like they have been in falls past and i think we need to understand that going forward to be really effective this fall in particular but i'm going to go through and and talk about kind of what normally happens during the fall transition because i know a lot of you guys are not necessarily only fishing chickamauga and around this region here less hours in the day daylight hours and with that comes cooler temps so the temperatures tend to start to drop off. And really a lot of what happens is it's almost like springtime fishing. You get a lot of fronts that move in. So you get a lot of fronts that are coming out of the north and fronts that are coming out of the south. And with that brings wind, of course, you got a tons of, of wind involved in that. So it's pushing fish around. And then you also have fluctuations in the water level typically. So as these fronts are going in, they're pushing a lot more current through the lake as the water levels are rising they're having to push out water so they can stay with their standard kind of decline in water level to winter pool is what they're trying to eventually work towards so you kind of get this little bit of an up and down in the water and also you know when you're talking about fluctuations you get changes in water clarity drastic changes sometimes so sometimes that water will be super muddy sometimes the water will be cleaning up and you'll have constant changing conditions that you have to adapt to when you're talking about fall fishing. Um, <clears throat> now, the reason why these fish are so susceptible in the fall to being caught, and the one reason why I really love fall time fishing is that the bait fish, or the fish rather, are very bait fish oriented. They're chasing around shoals of bait, and they're actively feeding. A lot of times they're actively schooling. So when that happens, it's really nice because you can just find the bait and usually find the fish. Now. On Chickamauga and a lot of Tennessee River lakes, there's so much bait that 
a lot of times you have to kind of figure out where the fish should be. So you'll find an area of a creek or an area of a flat, an area of a ledge that has a lot of bait on it. Well, that's good. So you found a general area. Now you have to figure out where those fish are sitting in that area. And like we've talked about, the bait fish tend to migrate towards the backs of creeks. So the major feeder creeks and stuff like that, the bait will a lot of times follow that. And I think it has a lot to do with the inflow uh, that you get from those fronts. So that rainwater coming in, it's like those fish push up into the area. I don't know if it's something they eat, but the bait fish tend to push back in those areas. They push back on ditches on main lake flats where that current's coming in, that fresh water's coming in, in pockets and things like that. And the fish will really load in there on them. I'm going to pop over real quick. So what I'm talking about when we're talking about major creeks, check that out. That's Chester Frost right there. That's one of the major creeks on this lake. So you got this, and what happens is those fish, the bait fish, they follow a lot of the migration routes that the largemouth do in the springtime. You know, they follow these creek channels, and they'll stop at all these little stopping points. So you got these secondary points here as you're moving back into each third of the creek. And a lot of times what they do is they'll end up, you see these on uh, Navionics, they mark the creek channels with these little uh, indicators right here, kind of like a dotted line there. And those bait fish will end up way in the backs of all these, and the fish will sit there and school and bust on them and stuff like that. So that can be a great way to kind of pattern chase around fish. What do we got for questions here? Mr. Aerosol Fidelity. Yeah, fishing down south is a lot different than fishing up north. For one thing, just tons more pressure from boaters and stuff like that. And if you're fishing these rivers, it can be a lot different than fishing a lot of those pothole lakes up north and stuff like that. Um, Jacob Lewis asked if they're hitting the rig yet. Absolutely. Uh, check out my video from, um, I think yesterday that video posted, I um, did a review on the Shimano SLX DC. It's actually this reel right here, but y'all check that video out. Um, I've got a couple a rig fish on that, but yeah, they've been biting the rig decently lately. Let's go up to some more major creeks here. How we got a, this is going to be Saudi Creek. And again, you can see the migration routes themselves are very obvious. You got those heavy creek channels there. You can see where the fish are gonna move across. So you see that as they move, they're gonna migrate through there. And so you just hit the fish as they're stopping. Now the, the main difference there between when you're talking about fall fishing and, uh, let's see here, fall fishing and spring fishing. So. Those fish, even though they use the same areas that they do in the springtime when they're coming in pre-spawn and post-spawn, it's different because they're not just pulling up there to stage. So in the pre-spawn, oftentimes what you'll find is you'll find the fish migrating back and it's often a pretty slow pace. They'll come a little ways, they'll back off. They'll come a little ways, they'll back off and they'll stage in those areas till they have the right conditions where they'll go up and spawn. And the same thing post-spawn, they'll kind of work their way back out. Now in the fall, it's completely different. It's all relying on the food. So these moves, these migratory patterns can be almost overnight. They can really push a long way. So you might go to one secondary point, catch a few fish one afternoon and think, hey, I'm gonna go back there tomorrow and catch some more. Well, the conditions have changed a little bit. Maybe it's rained a little bit and those bait fish have pushed on back or maybe the wind changed and it pushed the bait on back or it pushed them out. Those fish can be wildly different. You know, they can move hundreds of yards, quarters of miles even in these creeks. So you really have to kind of adapt to the conditions and follow these fish by really reading the signs out there. All right, another note that I have on here is <clears throat> something I've noticed a lot on this lake in particular, and just a lot of lakes I've fished in general. All of the predatory fish tend to make this migration. They tend to school up together. So if you've got striper or white bass in a body of water, those are extremely efficient predators. Spotted bass kind of run with white bass and, and stripers, but those are really effective predators. They're very fast. They're, um, they like to move around and chase bait. Now, largemouth will be in there as well. Crappie will be in there as well. Catfish, you name it. Everything is going to be in there feeding at the same time. So what I do is I'm out there and I get to an area. I'm using my side scan. I'm looking around, I find some bait. Well, then immediately I'm searching on my mapping. So let's go over here. I'm looking, so say, all right, let's do an example here. Say I pull back into Saudi Creek here. I go through the opening 
And immediately, once I start to hit this 10 to 12 foot of water around here, I start marking bait. So the first thing I'm going to do at that point is say to myself, okay, there's a bait here. I know kind of generally where the fish should be. What's the most obvious area these fish should be set up? Well, check this out. we got a point off the end of this flat. we got another point right here. we got a little hole right here. So depending on what the conditions are, I'm going to look around those areas and say, okay, where should the fish be? Now, along with that, I need to think about current. So where's the wind been blowing? Say the wind's been blowing really hard out of the north coming down through here. Well, those fish are going to be down on this side. If it's been blowing really hard on the south, they're going to be up on this side. Same thing east to west. So those things help me out a lot of times as well. So say we've had a bunch of rain. Well, there might be a lot of uh, current pumping out of the creek up here. And, of course, that'll create an eddy right around this area right here. And the fish might be stacked up there. So you just have to read things, understand where the fish should be. Now, as soon as I get around that area, I'm scanning. I'm looking out through there. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to find as much activity as I possibly can. I'm looking for birds. Um, this time of year, we start to see the seagulls come in. We start to see loons start to come in. We're a little bit early for loons, but they'll be coming soon. So I'm looking for seagulls, looking for loons. I'm looking for blue herons and things like that. I'm trying to figure out where there's any activity. As soon as I see that one little roll, I don't care if it's the tiniest little bit of activity out there, I'm going to go there, especially as it gets colder. You're just looking for any sign at all. And a lot of times you'll find the mother load of fish just, they might be out in open space. I can't tell you how many times they're completely off the area of structure you would think they would be. And so what happens typically, you got the white bass and you got the stripers, right? They're the ones actively pressuring and pushing these fish around. They take these big bait balls, they'll break it up into smaller bait balls and everything's just chaos in the backs of these creeks on these flats and areas like that. A lot of times it's shallower water too. So you might be 10 foot, Eight to ten foot, it might be four to six foot, wherever these fish happen to be going. But in that chaos, you have to understand largemouth bass, typically the kind that I want to catch anyway, they're not going to be out there actively chasing that bait as much. You're, I'm going to be looking for something, a spot on a spot. I'm going to be looking for something specific that's going to hold that right kind of fish. So say, let's go to another example. Say there is a massive school of fish right in this area. I'm seeing white bass blow up everywhere. I'm seeing little bass schooling all through this flat here. Immediately in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, what's going to hold that fish? So a lot of these creeks I've side scanned before. Maybe there is a big pile of stumps right here. Maybe there's a lay down. Maybe off of this point here, there's a, a point of grass that grows out a little deeper. What is that one thing in that area where all those fish are that you would think would hold the biggest fish. And that's really key to picking out and finding those bigger fish. Now, what I, what I notice also is that they'll school, you know, the larger, uh, the bigger largemouth will school on specific size bait. So if you're in an area long enough, you know, a lot of times I'll get into these areas where fish are schooling and yeah, I'm, I'm actively fishing, but the whole time I'm scanning and I'm looking for where in that area am I seeing those bigger blow-ups? Where am I seeing those bigger fish eating at? And what size bait are they eating? So many times you'll notice um, there's fish schooling all around, you know, white bass, little bass and stuff, and they're all feeding on bait that's two and a half inches long. Well, nothing's happening. All of a sudden in a similar area, very close to there, the big fish start to come up. You're seeing five, six, seven pounders blowing up around the boat. And they're schooling on thread fin that are four and a half inches. That's extremely important to know. You know, when you're talking about fishing and fishermen, a lot of times we get in our minds that you need to match the hatch. And that's very important, but you need to match the hatch of the quality of fish that you're fishing for. So many times they get wired in that bigger fish, you know, three to five to six pounders, they're eating a little bit bigger bait. And they're, since they're ambush predators, they're going to sit in those areas and wait longer for the right size bait, the right school of bait to come by for them to ambush. Sometimes it's gizzard shad too. I've seen it specifically where there's little fish going on thread fin and a shoal of gizzard shad will move through an area and then the big fish will start blowing up on those gizzard shad. So always be super aware when you're talking about that. All right, I'm going to answer some questions real quick. 
only on one point in the whole creek caught fish small but fun yeah that's that's often the case especially as we start to progress in the winter the <clears throat> it's like there's a huge biomass of fish in one area so you can go it's not like you just go and you find you know go into a creek and you hit every secondary point and you catch three fish on it so many times it's two points out of the 30 back there that have all the fish on it so that's why moving quickly is key we'll talk about that in a second a 60 degree water temp, do you think shad are heading into creek or out, midway out the creek? All right, typically in 60 degree water temperature, those shad have already pushed back. They're already back in the creek. They're not even thinking about moving out. I usually don't see shad on our lakes really making that migration out until you start getting water into the low 50s and really around 50. And then that's really when you start seeing a bigger amount of shad pushing out. And in a deeper creek, you know, they might stay there through most of the winter as well. So again, that's where getting out there with those electronics really pays off and, and paying attention to that kind of stuff. When you start throwing red color crankbaits such as Rapal and Demon Color, you think it starts certain water temp, you just find it as a pre-spawn deal. I typically start throwing red cranks anytime I want to. Uh, I throw red cranks in the summertime quite often. Really, they get a reaction bite. So even if fish are feeding on shad, if say they're off of the shad pattern, you can either do one of two things. I don't say they're off the shad pattern. What I mean is that if they're finicky, you can do one of two things. One, you can go really realistic, really transparent. And try to fool a fish or you can throw something red or sartreuse in there and try to tick one off i don't know what it is but if you get a lot of fish together you throw something that looks gaudy and crazy and different than all the other bait fish in there sometimes those fish will swing on that thing so that's an important thing to know but really when you're talking about them keying in on those crawfish i find that to be more of a winter to early pre-spawn kind of deal when they're feeding on like red colored crawls and that's when that kind of bite really kicks off traditionally but don't be afraid to throw a, a red 6xd or 10xd in the summertime <laughs> carrot you got to argue with somebody about this topic that's funny big baits catch big bass that's right you know and a lot of things i haven't talked about that yet but uh in the fall time there's a good big swim bait bite as well so we'll we'll talk about that in a minute as well let's see here what kind of bait should you use in Chester Frost area? Well, with this cold front pushing through, it's, we're going to have a warming trend towards the end of the week. Right now, if I was going to go into Chester Frost, I know there's tons of bait in there. So I would be hitting a lot of those points. I'd be hitting ditches on the flats there and looking for activity. As soon as I found those fish, I'd throw a rig on them. I'd throw a deep diving jerk bait on them because I'm assuming a lot of them are going to be a six to eight foot of water. I would hop a lipless on the bottom if they're on the bottom like that. And if they're not really keying in on those faster moving baits, I'd pull out an eco rig or a drop shot and catch them like that. But I always want to check those faster moving baits first, see if I can get them to go on it. You might try a single swim bait as well if they're school and finicky. Sometimes that smaller single swim bait will get them. Uh, am I seeing fall patterns on my waters? Absolutely. Yeah, we're knee deep in fall fishing right now, which is awesome. What action rod do I throw my jerk baits on? I throw my jerk baits on, it's actually a, a graphite rod. I'm, I'm not a big glass rod fan, so I use a medium heavy, moderate action rod. So with that medium heavy, it's seven foot. I still have the snap using the little bit heavier action rod. You know, I have that snap that I can really work that bait, but I have the moderate action. So when I pull into a fish with those smaller treble hooks, I don't have to worry about them Pulling those hooks through and i use that canine original fluoro as well which is a, a type of copolymer. it's basically fluorocarbon with nylon added to it so it's super clear it still has some sink to it but it also has some stretch so that also helps me keep from pulling those hooks another great jerkbait rod is a six and a half to seven foot medium fast action rod because you have enough bow in the medium action but you have the fast action so when you work that bait you can get a consistent rip on it which is important. I haven't, Mr. Garrett asked about the Vision 110 plus two. I don't have any yet, but believe me, I'm gonna have some in hand. I'm gonna be using them on some spotted bass lakes around here. I'm gonna be using them on Chickamauga. As the winter goes, as we get further into winter, a lot of times some of these areas I fish really clear up. And I think that, that deeper dive and jerk bait is gonna be key for that. Okay, so like we were talking about before, predatory fish, I'm gonna kind of get back on topic here. 
predatory fish school up together with all the fish. Um, another thing that I, I learned this from Tactical Bassin. It's been years ago. They did a fall fishing video, and they talked about all sizes of fish schooling together. And I have really noticed that to be true the last four or five years. Can't tell you how many times in the fall I'll be throwing a small crankbait, or I'll be throwing a jerk bait or a lipless, and I catch a fish. You know, like I have a white bass on. It's a pound or a pound bass, and I'm bringing it in, and a daggum eight to ten pounder comes up and crushes it at the boat. Those big fish are in there, in this huge biomass of fish. The right kind of fish, the fish you want to catch are in there. It's just a matter of trying to get them to bite. And there's two ways you can do that. One is you just sit there and you weed through numbers. It's just sheer volume of fish catches. You find something that they're on. Maybe they're on a topwater spook. You just work it as fast as you can. You catch 40 fish and four or five of them will be the right size fish. It might be a rig. You know, you catch 40, 50 fish. There'll be a few of them that are the right size fish, but you can also do some things like you can slow down, go to the bottom, maybe hop a lipless through there. You can um, drag a, a drop shot through there and maybe power shot, maybe do a bigger drop shot through there. Um, <clears throat> you can throw a big swim bait through there. Sometimes you can get bit on that. Now the majority of the fish are keyed in on a certain size bait, so you won't get bites. And it's so frustrating when you're sitting there watching fish blow up all around you and the guy in the front of the boat's catching a bass every cast and you're fishing for that one. But it can be done. It's just a matter of getting out there and being patient on there. So one thing that I do, like I just said, I throw something big. So I might go to a, you know, my depth's 250, a 10 inch glide bait. And I might throw a 10 inch glide bait through there. I might throw a huge soft plastic, a 10 inch mag draft through there. Or I might go completely the opposite way. I might do something small and very unique. Like I was talking about before, I might take a red lipless or sartreuse mustard colored lipless and fire that in there and see if I can get a reaction bite on that, kind of work it quick through there. Or I might do something unique like throwing a Nico rig with a weird color on there or drop shot, something in there. Because there are two schools of thought as the water really starts to cool down, it seems like a lot of the mid-size baits that you're throwing are not working as well. So it pays to go really small. You might go to that little bitty smoke grub, something really tiny, a Ned rig, or you might go really big to a huge bait, big rig with a lot of big swim baits on it, or some kind of big swim bait like we were talking about there. And the last thing I wanna talk about, I kinda of touched on a little bit before, and that's covering water. When you're talking about fall fishing, the fish, like I said before, they're grouped up, the biomass is very, grouped up and as you get to winter it even shrinks even more there might be a hundred fish in a spot the size of two of your boats so covering water is absolutely essential you need to get out there and you know if you're in the back of a creek say it's you're getting towards winter or something like that you're towards the mouth of a creek and towards the towards winter but anyway and you're not seeing as much surface activity not as much bird activity you should be trying to hit 100 points a day you should be trying to hit 100 little offshore structures a day you should be Trying to, whatever pattern you're trying to run, you should try to do it as much of it as possible. Run all over the lake, do whatever's necessary to find a group of fish. Because once you find a group, you know, a lot of guys, they're thinking winter fishing. They're going out there to get five bites. Not me. When I'm winter fishing, I'm going out there to catch 100 fish. And you can really do it if you're, you know, put the time in, find out where these fish are grouped up. And it, sometimes it's a timing deal. So a lot of times... The fish, what they'll do is they'll tend to feed early in the morning or late, late, late in the afternoon. So you have to kind of determine what the fish are doing. But in that downtime, I don't pull off the water. Say it's noon or something like that and the fish are not biting really good. I'll stay out there. I'll spend that time side scanning. I'll spend that time jumping around looking, locating schools of fish. And then I'll come back and hit them during prime time. And that's when I'll get well in heartbeat. All right. Now going back over to some questions here. winter time and really for me um, I kind of pull away now our water temperatures typically don't get much lower than low 40s so technically you know a lot of guys over in Midwest and stuff like that out towards California they throw glide baits in conditions like that they would throw them all winter long now for me I've noticed that the fish tend to get off of that glide you might throw something with a really wide glide to it and just slow swim it um, but a lot of times, you know, I'm going to go to a soft swim bait at that point. And, and really, I don't go as big 
on those soft swim baits in the dead, dead of winter, as you would think. I'm not going to throw a, you know, a 10 inch Huddleston out there. I might pick up a 68 special or an eight inch Huddleston, something with a vortex tail or something that's really soft. Um, you can throw a bait. The main thing is just get out there. You can boil some of these swim baits, get good action at them, get some um, anise oil, put your swim baits in oil to soften them up and then go test the action of them. So you can get some of these swim baits that wouldn't typically swim well in really cold water. You can kind of mess with them and finagle them and get them to do what you're talking about or what you need them to do over there. Sean Z, big fish are lazy. They sit under smaller fish and let them do the work. And that's, that's true. I, I've really noticed that. I, I feel like that they're, they're sitting down there. I don't know if it's them letting the smaller fish do the work. You know, one thing I always used to talk to my dad and my grandfather about is them eating the, the other bait fish as they're dying and falling down. But there's so many catfish and smaller bass in there. I really don't think they do that. What I've noticed the last few years is that a lot of those bigger fish, they've got full-size crappie in them. They've got little yellow bass, like uh, barfish inside of them. They eat white bass off the end of my line all the time. They eat smaller bass at the end of my line all the time. So I think that they're just sitting down there with all that activity, and it's like they're waiting for an opportunity. They're waiting on one of those smaller fish to be preoccupied and messed up, and they'll come up and tag it. All right. Any more questions? Let's let's just talk fall fishing. Any questions you have about winter, things like that, different baits, we can start to, to move through some of that. I'm going to show you all one bait that I'm super excited about. Morgan over at Tackle Freaks. I was talking with him the other day, and uh, he got something for me here. Ordered out. I'm about to, to get a few of them. Let's see if we can find it here. Oh, you guys are not even seeing what I'm seeing, are you? Can't see the products. Yeah, okay. Hold on, hold on. Now can you see it? There it is. Boom. That's the babe right there. 715 product right there. See it? All right. The line through version of it is fantastic. It runs a little deeper in the water column than some of the other line through baits. I've got similar kind of to an Osprey, but very subtle head shakes, head shimmies, and the whole bait doesn't wobble. It's just really the, the tail section of it. So really, I think this is gonna be a fantastic wintertime bait, middle of the water column type bait. You need to pick some up. I've already got several and I've caught several Several good fish on them already as well. I'm going to jump over here again to the hard baits so you guys can see that lipless I'm talking about. It's a suspending quake right here. Look at that. Boom. These are the colors I was talking about. Oh, can't say I didn't show them to you. I did. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, I should have, uh, should have paid better attention to that. But... Let's see here. Another thing that I do when you're talking about wintertime fishing or late fall type fishing, when those fish kind of get finicky, when the water temps really start to drop, these mid-depth running small body crankbaits can be absolutely amazing. You know, whether it's a, a shad wrap, 3XD is fantastic, and these Bandit 200 and 300, especially if you're on smallmouth, the Bandit has a much smaller body on it, and they can be absolutely money. One that I've gotten turned on to recently is that Spro Rock Crawler. Um, let's see here. Yeah, this one right here. I think it's the 55 is the one I use. The one that dives deeper is the one I'm talking about, but that bait is very similar to a Wiggle Wart, which I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of my videos, but I really am a big fan of the new Wiggle Wart and the old Wiggle Wart. And that Rock Crawler, crawler is similar, but it's got, a, I don't know, even know how to describe it. It dives a little deeper for one. It's got a really unique sound to it. And sometimes you go in areas and they won't hit the, the uh, wiggle wart, but they'll hit the rock crawler and vice versa. So it's something you got to have in your uh, arsenal there. Terry Scroggins. Okay, thank you, Sean, for that. Yeah, they modeled the babe later after it. Okay, so that that's the bait I'm talking about. That's the tournament I'm talking about. Go look it up on Bassmaster, guys. It's a really cool watch. Awesome tournament. Airsoft Fidelity, you want to go fishing with me one time? Dude, it might work out. Uh, you need to message me on Facebook or Instagram, and I'll see what I can do about getting out there. I've got tons of people that want to fish with me. I schedule a lot of fishing trips, so you have to be patient with me, but I'm sure we can probably find a way to get out there and go.
Yeah, Andrew, you're right. Those uh, little bandit crankbaits are awesome for spotted bass on spotted bass lakes as well. It's hard to get away from that. When it gets really cold, though, they'll pull off of those, the bandits, and they'll pull off the wiggle warts. And that original shad wrap, man, it's hard to beat that kind of design and body style. Uh, Strike King makes one that, that works really well as well, but those older style ones, man, they can really, really dag them get the job done. I'll show you a jerk bait too that I've been doing really well on lately. And this is another recommendation from uh, the guys over at Tactical Bass. And this one right here, the uh, Jackal Rerange jerk bait. It is the most bizarre jerk bait you will ever fish with because every time you whip that thing out there, I've got that RT minnow color and I've got the uh, high definition silver shad color like this as well, but it's bizarre. You throw, you fire it out there and it makes this loud pop. It sounds like you've hit your windshield or um, snap your line every single time, but uh, it, it casts a mile. It's a weight transfer system popping back into that thing. It's got a ton of flash, but I will say you need to make sure that you have, you're fishing it on a stiff enough rod that you can really put a lot of um, action. You can really pop that thing hard and give it slack because it wants to go so far to the side that it doesn't work correctly if you have a rod that's too moderate for it. You got to make sure that you, you know, throw it out in front of the boat where you can see it and understand how hard you have to hit that bait. And I, I saw the same thing um, with the Strike King, the KVD jerk bait as well. Um, you really have to hit those jerk baits hard to get the right kind of action out of them. On the other hand, like a Vision 110 or the, the Plus One that I use a lot, um, not as much action. You don't really have to hit those baits as hard to get the action that you want. In fact, if you hit them too hard, it's like they'll blow out and they won't react correctly. And then there's, of course, the Rapala jerk baits. It's kind of in between. I really like those shadow wraps. That's right, White Whale. Make sure everybody smashes that like button. It really helps me out. Jared Adams, what'd you miss? Not too much, man. Go on, you know, go back and rewatch the the stream. You missed a lot of the the detailed information, but now we're just hanging out. We're talking fall bass fishing now. Y'all need to go over. I know there's we got 33 people watching right now. Go over and watch that video I posted yesterday. I've got some awesome. It hasn't gotten a whole lot of views right now. I don't know why, but some awesome fish catches on there. Some of the the coolest visuals too, because I got like the sunset going in the background. I didn't have to do hardly any editing to the color because it just looks fantastic by itself. But I was checking out the uh, Shimano SLX DC reel. See how many they got in stock now. Everybody knows I am a diehard lose guy. Like I love my lose reels and I won't give them up to save anything but i wanted to try out a dc reel and they sent me this uh the shimano slx dc and it was just fun dudes i mean it it's it's interesting it's like almost like just one of those things you have to try once i mean it, it and uh they gave me a discount for code for it i'm gonna put it up right now in the live chat here it's bass quest 2019 is the discount code there so if you type that in i think you can get it cheaper than pretty much anywhere else you can get it to your door, it's like 180 bucks if you use that code. So y'all might want to check that out. I just think it's dang cool. That DC reel makes a crazy noise, but literally the setting's super easy. You just work the, the spool tension knob, you tighten it down to where there's no play in the spool, and then it only has four settings. You can do pretty much whatever you need to do with just those four settings. I did, in this video, I caught a bunch of fish from all the way from like eighth ounce drop shots and tubes to big Alabama rigs and big swim baits. And uh, I never changed it off a of two, and it did everything it needed to do, which was awesome. See you later, Whitewell. Jared says he hasn't touched another jerk bait. I highly recommend it because I kind of did the same thing for a couple years. Once I found that plus two or plus one, I really kind of got latched onto it. But I've noticed so many times the fish will be off of that bait and they'll be really on another. So when, when they're not hitting the, the 110 as much, they'll crush that uh, Provoke from Six Sense or they'll be crushing the Rerange or they'll be crushing the uh, Rapala Shadow Wrap. So 
make sure you have that variety. Don't get overly confident in one bait to where you become one dimensional on your jerk bait fishing. Jerk bait fishing is really similar to fishing a lipless, in my opinion, because what ends up happening is, uh, let's go back over here. What ends up happening is the fish jump to different types. They want a different action. They want a different sound on it. So you really have to have a lot available and be willing to go through them in order to really stay on what those fish are eating. Hey, what's up, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, me and uh, me and Mr. Fluke Master, Mikey Balls, Alex Rudd, and Ben Noak, we were all at Lake X the other day doing some fishing. It was tough out there, but man, I, uh, I've got some footage of a fish that we had in the net that still managed to get away, slipped out of my fingers. That was enormous. It would have absolutely crushed my personal best spotted bass by a long shot. Very sad that that didn't come in the boat, but it'll make for some entertaining footage for you guys. Um, Zane says, have you skipped with the DC reel? And that's one thing I, I do note in that review. For me, <clears throat> so if you're a beginner, if you are not used to skipping a bait cast reel, the DC could be awesome for you, especially if you dial it to like the one or two setting. But for me, I'm used to having my reel like completely free. And so when I went to skip or if I was doing a pitch, you know, like a really detailed pitch, instead of me being able to control what was going on, that DC reel, it would see that the spool was kind of opening up too much and it would want to hold me back a little bit. And what that happens is your trajectory starts to rise a little bit. So when you're skipping, you might get that rise. It wouldn't hit exactly where I wanted it. When I was flipping, if I was trying to get, say I'm going into a dock this wide and I want to skip it or flip it into there, it wanted to rise up and touch that. So for me, it threw me off a little bit. But if you're a beginner just starting that, it could be awesome for that. And you could just dial it. Of course, you can make this reel completely free. If you put it on one and you dial back this full tension knob, you can do the same thing that I do with my lose reels. So I think it would work great for it. Yeah, Sean, that lake is that that lake can be super tough. It really, I've had days where you go over there and you just absolutely wreck them, and then it's either one or the other. You either go and you crush or you get crushed. Now we caught quite a few fish. Um, you know, we we pulled out the drop shot, pulled out the old standby, the little six inch lizard, threw them into the brush piles over there. We flipped around. We caught quite a few fish, but. Uh, didn't catch as many doing what I wanted to do, which was the big swim bait and the big top water. And uh, didn't get as many opportunities at the giant fish. We were a little off. I think we were just a few days off one way or another from really hitting those big fish right. Spencer, tournament out of December. Let's see here, Chickamauga Dam. Any tips on what to do? Chickamauga Dam, you're going to be on the south end of the lake. December 7th. Those fish are going to be kind of full-blown winter. But I noticed like in around Harrison Bay, like even into the creek there and into Chester Frost creeks, um, a lot of those fish, they just set up at the mouth of the creek or they'll be in the first third. You just look for the bait, look for the fish on your side scan. And so many times, like last year, there was tons and tons of loons down there and they would tell you where the fish were over and over. So it just depends on what's going on. You might want to message me as we get closer to time because I think there were some points in December last year where we had, you know, days that were in the 60s and almost 70s and so uh, the water temps rose a lot and the fish got super active but even more schooling again so you never know message me about two or three weeks out and i'll try to help you out but yeah talking about that dc reel y'all should check that thing out i don't know how uh, long they're gonna let that code go for um, but you should jump on it. If you want one of those reels, you should jump on it and use the code because, like I said, it is cheaper. You can get it anywhere else. And they got limited quantities of the things. So if you, it's one of those things, if you snooze, you lose. I have the, uh, the seven gear ratio. What is it? It's a seven two to one. I really like that overall. Um, this bait or this reel, I should say, is super versatile. Like, like I was saying, I threw all kinds of different stuff with it. So it's really something you could use for just about everything. So that seven, I feel like the seven or the six gear ratio would probably be something really good to have. If you're wanting just an extra reel, like a workhorse reel, that's a really good one. Yeah, Sean, that's smart. Yeah, putting in, a, <laughs> I know a lot of guys that do that. They'll fish a tournament out of Chester Frost or fish a tournament out of Chickamauga Dam, and they'll just lock through in a nick jack and go fish the tail race. That's a good way, especially if Chickamauga's fishing tough, you can, lock through and go fish those tail races 
And a lot of times you can catch, you know, we're only allowed to keep, I think, two smallmouth over 18, but you might go down there and catch two four pound smallmouth and they could end up being your, uh, you know, two for eight. And then your kicker fish, you know, if, if most guys are coming in with 15 pounds, that really gives you the opportunity to uh, jump up in the standings there. Zane asked if I use a seven speed for cranking in the wintertime. No, I do not. And it's just because I'm a spaz. Uh, if I use a uh, gear ratio that's too fast, I'll completely just blow out what I'm trying to do. So I've actually got a ton of reels that are between the fives and the sixes range, and that helps me to slow down. Even though I tend to get excited and reel a little bit faster, that helps me to slow down and do what I need to do to, to not blow those cranks out. I've got another cool video that's posting tomorrow. So y'all stay tuned for that. I think I'm going to post at 3 p.m. tomorrow. So kind of set your... Make sure we, you subscribe to the channel for one and make sure you ring the bell for notifications. When you ring it, it'll ask you if you want personalized or you want all notifications. Make sure you click all. And it'll just it'll show you. It'll send you an alert when I post a video. That way you're not wondering if something's hit or not. YouTube's crazy with the notifications the last year or so. Uh, Brandon asked if I was on Nick and Jack in the last vid. Yes, I was on Nick and Jack for pretty much all of the first part of the video. The two swim bait catches at the end of the video the bonus catches on there they were both on chickamauga uh, mike asked if i'm catching um plenty of fish on a rig on chick right now and yeah i'm catching fish on a rig on chick for sure um really I, a lot of the schooling fish are kind of shying from it i've been throwing it when they get really fired up though to try to get a double and unfortunately i haven't pulled off any doubles yet this fall but um, I, I've been on a few schools and it's like they would eat that jerk bait every day in cast. And I just picked up the rig just to see if I catch a bigger fish for one or if I could go ahead and uh, catch two at a time. But yeah, jerk bait, lipless, uh, smaller swim bait. A lot of times these fish, have, when they get really finicky, especially earlier in the afternoon or earlier in the morning, when they're not quite reacting as well. You can hit them with that uh, something finessier like an underspin Scott's. Um, war pig underspin with a little kai tech on the back of it that can be fantastic as a finessier bait to run through there or just a standard swim bait head and a small kai tech that seems to work really well another thing that's that's kind of kind of secret bait that you saw in that video if you watched that video from yesterday scott's new smaller scrounger so it's got a two aught or a three aught hook in it i've got it in a quarter ounce and not quite a half ounce yeah but uh He's got a smaller pintail. So if you've been looking at his little pintail shad or spunk shad, he's got one instead of like the four and a half inch, he's got a three inch or three and a half inch now. That thing is dynamite on those schooling fish when they get finicky and stuff. Yeah, Sean, I'm gonna do a bunch of smallmouth fishing. So I'm gonna announce a series probably at the end of this week or sometime next week. And my goal for the next month, so this fall into winter into spring i'm going to call it like the big three series and i'm going to be trying to catch my personal best spotted bass smallmouth and largemouth and i'm especially going to key in a lot on big spotted bass and big smallmouth bass this winter time especially when our lake's getting pounded by the pro anglers in uh, you know february and stuff like that chickamauga is i'm gonna really be hammering down trying to catch a smallmouth over six pounds a spotted bass over five pounds and, uh, of course, I'll be fishing for that teener size largemouth. That's like my life goal is to catch a 13-pound largemouth. That's awesome, Andrew. Yeah, I've been trying to catch me a double on that rig. And I, it's funny because I've been on some crazy school bites, schooling bites this year where, I mean, it's like boom, boom, you know, every cast. And I'll hook one, and I'll kind of pause for a minute, and I'm trying to let that other one hook up, and I can feel them running through the rig. I can see them running through the rig, and they're not getting hooked up. And I'm like, gosh. You know, usually every year I catch 10 or 15 doubles, but – this year, I just hadn't been able to pull it off, and I've lost two monster fish on a rig this year already, which is super, super tough. That's a good point. So, talking about rig fishing, I've been throwing Scott's Harvester rig and the Five Wire Eight Blade a lot. If y'all watch my rig video from last year, you need to go find it if you haven't seen it. But I do some things to it. I change out different colors of swim baits, different sizes, different types of swim baits on there. I uh, change out the blades to different sizes, sometimes colored blades and stuff like that to get those fish to key in on my rig. But one thing that I do in the winter time is I use light wire open hooks. And I found out very fast um, earlier this, you know, with a couple weeks ago when the water temps were still in the 60s, those fish are strong. You cannot be using light wire hooks 
um, early in season throwing a rig, you got to jump up. I've got a 2X hook on mine or a weedless hook right now like I used to do because I had uh, two really nice fish straighten out hooks on that rig. One of them was close to 8 to 10 pounds. Another one was about a six pounder. And then I had one the other day I didn't even see. I couldn't hardly move her though. <laughs> um, Airsoft asked uh, what kind of fishing rod is good for frogging. For me, I like a 7.3 to 7.6. I want a heavy action, um, but I want it built more like a swim bait rod. So I want heavy action, but I want a little bit of tip. You need about a foot or so maybe a foot and a half of that rod to be tipped. That way you can work that thing correctly. And that way it's it's modern enough to when you bow into that fish and she's head shaking, she's locked into that hydrilla, that you can keep her coming. And if you pull her out and she pops forward, that rod's not gonna completely unload. If the rod action is too fast, that rod will unload and a lot of times they'll be able to throw it. One thing, talking about frog fishing, we have awesome grass. I know I mentioned that earlier in the video, but the frog bite, gosh, it's been spotty this year. It seems like uh, about three weeks ago, it was decent for a little while, and then it was like it was done. Um, it's just about now, though, it should be getting dang good, so I don't know. I don't know if it's going to happen good this year or not. Garrett, I am completely down to come with you, buddy. Uh, you call me anytime. We'll go down there and do some fishing. I love fishing some Nicky Jack. Love it. Absolutely love it. You just message me on Facebook or Instagram. We'll get that locked in, set up. What's my PB? Uh, Braden asking, what's my PB? So my personal best largemouth is 10.42. Personal best spotted bass is 4 pounds, 12 ounces. Personal best smallmouth bass is 5 pounds, 7 ounces. I've caught so many 4-pound spots. I've caught so many smallmouth in the 5-pound range. It's absurd but I can't make it happen with that sixer. I want to catch a six or seven so bad. I want to catch a five pound spot so bad. Is there much grass up around Cell Creek? There's a lot of grass in Cell Creek right now. Um, really towards the first part of the creek. So if you know about Cell Creek, it's narrow, then it opens up to the, the big area where the campground is and Brown's Bridge. This on um, this side of Brown's Bridge, so going out to the river, let's go ahead and look at it. Let's see. Gonna work our way up on the Sail Creek. This part of the creek right here has plenty of grass um, on all the flats and stuff like that. But when you work back further, there's not as much. There's some out here, but it's it's so dang shallow now that it's not even worth fishing. Um, but yeah, there's there's some grass up there. There's a lot of grass main lake on these flats up through here right now. And there's, there's pretty much grass everywhere on the mid lake, kind of the normal places, you know, on big flats and in the creeks themselves. Yeah, it is a crazy year, Sean. It, I'm kind of curious to see what the winter bite's going to be like. I think it's going to be really good. If we can get some stable, stable temperatures. I wouldn't mind if it gets super dang cold. If it gets really cold, I'd be happy about that. All right, any more questions, guys? We're about literally one minute. I'm going to wrap the stream up. Last last chance questions. Yeah, Mike, a lot has died out in Chester Frost already. Tons and tons of stuff has died out already. So, And what's happening is the water's dropping so fast. When that water drops the way it is, when it drops like that, it really just pulls out from a lot of that grass. So thankfully, some of it grew out deeper. If you can find those areas that did grow out deeper, you'll have some small isolated mats. It's probably going to be your best chance for a last minute frog bite, and then the frog bite is going to be pretty much over after that. Yeah, Andrew, seriously, dude, hit me up. I'd love to go hit Lake X with you sometime and go after those big spotted bass. I'm going to be hitting up uh, Lake X with a lot of or several different guys that are, are good on that lake this year. So. Hit me up. We'll see what we can do on that for sure. For sure. Yeah, got to get got to get that big spotted bass. Especially, y'all wait till you see this video. I'm talking a daggum giant. Giant. Giant, giant, giant. There's a dude in the boat that's seen several six-pound spotted bass, and he thought it was right up there around that six-pound range. So, mega, 
mega spotted bass. Missed out on it, unfortunately. But it's what it is. You can't catch them all. Like I said, it's it's a hilarious. Like it makes me want to cry when I watch it, but it's so dang funny. So I can't wait to show that to you. That'll probably be able to open up that series. But yeah, it's it's pretty good stuff. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I will catch y'all on the next one. I'm gonna answer one last question. Mr. Airsoft asked. If I've used Guggen baits, I have used several Guggen baits, and I gotta say, I like them. I really like the Crack and Crawl, and I like the Bandito Bug. I like the Crack and Crawl as a jig trailer, especially. It seems like it holds up even a little bit better than a Rage Crawl. That's all I gotta say about that. What's up, Morgan? Hey, Morgan at Tackle Freaks just joined us. What's up, my dude? He's the guy that made that last video possible, so y'all say thank you to him. He's the one that sent me this reel, which is dang awesome. So hit him up, fo show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Zane asks, what's the best rod for dragon jigs? I'll tell you the the rod that I've been using a lot lately for dragon jigs. And now, granted, I use smaller jigs um, as we get into the fall and winter. I start to pull out the finesse jigs and stuff like that. A little bit lighter wire hooks. I use the MGC custom tackle finesse jigs. But I've been using a. I don't have it in here with me right now. But it's a Joe Burns custom rod. It is a seven foot three medium heavy, and I had it custom made. He made it for me with medium guides. So it's a little bit bigger guide on there. And what that allows for is I'm going to be able to fish that into the wintertime. I don't have to worry about my guides freezing up in the super cold water. So that will be fantastic. Fantastic right there. Um, but yeah, any kind of 7.3 to 7.6. The Joe Burns custom rod is awesome. Um, another budget rod, get the Dobbins Fury series, is, it's just hard to beat. Dobbins makes probably one of the best rods out there, period. So you might try one of those out and, and see if you like it. Another one, if you want to go a little bit more expensive, probably one of my favorite rods I've got right now in my boat is the Mark Rose Lose series. Um, his ledge series rods are awesome and they're really versatile. You can do a lot of things with them. Um, one rod that I've enjoyed throwing jigs on this year, one of the Mark Rose series is his 7.6 ledge swim bait rod. And it's got enough tip to it. It's a heavy action, but it's got enough tip to it. And it's awesome for throwing jigs. Um, so I did a lot of that. I threw jigs with it. I've thrown rigs with it. I've thrown swim baits with it. I mean, you name it, and that rod will do it. Another thing, guys, I'm going to go ahead before I close the video out. I forgot to mention this earlier. I've got a 7.6 G-Rod Game Changer right here. It's like a $280 rod. And I'm getting rid of it just because I don't have I've got so many 7.6 to 7.11 rods right now. It's dumb. So I'm trying to get rid of this so I can uh, actually... Get another spinning rod, maybe. Get a another seven foot, just all purpose type rod. But if anyone's interested in this rod, feel free to message me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, thinking about getting rid of. I mean, I'd get rid of it for 150 bucks, maybe 130 bucks. I don't know, holler at me, make me an offer. I might take it. Who knows? Let's see here. Morgan's asking if anybody wants to buy a reel. I don't know yet. Hopefully so. I've talked about it a couple times. But anyway, dudes, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for watching the, the uh, stream as always. Stay tuned for tomorrow, 3 o'clock. Another upload coming your way. And I'm planning on doing another stream next week. So I appreciate all y'all's support. Appreciate all the love. Uh, update on Tristan. He's been doing well. I know a lot of people have been messaging me, making sure little man's doing good. He's actually working the right direction now. So he's got a long road ahead. He's still way behind on weight. Um, but I think the meds that they've got him on right now are doing what they need to do. And I think that uh, I think that he's working in the right direction. He's putting on some weight. We're not going backwards and everything like that. Oh, it looks like uh, Morgan gave us a a code here. If you go to Bass Quest Live, use code Bass Quest Live on Tackle Freaks, ten dollars off. So, y'all do that. Use that Bass Quest Live. I'll go ahead and uh, put that down in the video. But if you do that, ten dollars off your order. Be sweet. Time to stack up on those provoke uh, 
jerk baits and that daggum suspended quake that we were talking about earlier. All right, dudes. It's going to wrap it up. Thanks, as always, for hanging out. Thanks for watching. I will catch you guys on the next one.